To my far left, we have Peggy Carr. Peggy's the commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics and the Institute of Education Sciences at the US Department of Education. Before becoming commissioner, she served as associate commissioner of, the, of assessment at NCES for 20 years, where she oversaw national and international large scale as assessments. This includes the National Assessment for edu of Education Progress, or NAEP, which we will be discussing today. Mm -hmm. Peggy is a published researcher on the topics of student achievement and equity, and she has over a decade of teaching experience of graduate level courses in statistics and research methodology. Her public service has been widely recognized, which includes receiving the American Educational Research Association's Distinguished Public Service Award in 2022, and the Secretary's Golden Apple Award for Exceptional Service in 2016. We are also joined by Kent McGuire. Kent is Program Director of Education at the William and Flora Hewitt Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic institutions in the United States. He leads the foundation's teaching and learning and open educational resources strategies with a focus on helping, helping all students succeed in college, work, and civic, civic life. Kent has previously held many leadership positions. You can keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep many jobs. <laughs> so across the education ecosystem, including president and CEO of the Southern Education Foundation, Dean of the College of Education at Temple University, where he was also a tenured faculty member, and Assistant Secretary of the US Department of Education, just to name a few. Yes. <laughs> Currently also serves on the boards of the Wallace Foundation, Teachers College, Columbia University, and the Success for All Foundation. So please join me in welcoming both Peggy and Kent. So I'm going to start us off by first just acknowledging the fact that the pandemic was not the cause of yeah. so many of the inequities that we see. Before the pandemic in the United States, only 20% of children had access to high quality early childhood education. And by fourth grade, only 35% of students were proficient in reading and only 34% of eighth graders were proficient in math. And in higher education, more than a quarter of low income students who enroll and a four-year institution drop out by the end of the second year. And our higher education graduation rates um, are less than 50% for those reaching a bachelor's degree. So the issues and, and challenges that we're gonna be talking about today are not a new phenomenon, but the pandemic certainly brought a lot new light to these stark realities faced by our students and our communities. As Professor Paul Revel, who you will be seeing in the next panel, he'll be mo who will be moderating the next panel, as he wrote, it's as though a big wave pulled back the sea, mm -hmm. revealing the ocean floor and all its disturbing realities that heretofore yeah. had been hidden beneath the surface of the water. Yeah. Now, more than that, the pandemic certainly exacerbated problems that we've had, and it may have washed away some of the progress that we've made in recent decades. So Peggy, I welcome you to provide some opening comments and perspective on what we've seen. Well, thank you um, for the great introduction, especially because you talked about a lot of statistics right out of the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, it is the foundation of everything. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for this opportunity to uh, address this uh, audience today. This is a great thing that you're doing here, getting us started on the beyond, because we have a lot of work to do. Yes. Uh, what I would like to do with my, my time um, this morning is, is to talk about what we know, what we've learned during this time period over the past two years in uh, keeping watch on the education uh, data um, during the pandemic. Well, we've been in shock. Uh, the education um, system as we know it will never be the same. I think that uh, we are all looking forward to what to do next and the, the new normal. It is a moment in time when we need to take stock and look very closely at our students, their mental health, and their teachers, teachers the whole system. What will we do next? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the lay of the land in terms of uh, academic performance of our students. Call it what you like. Learning challenges, unfinished learning, learning loss, whatever suits your fancy. 
Um, but that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. I'm going to remind you of a release that we did just a few weeks ago um, from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's the long-term trend assessment. Uh, NAEP uh, has been around for decades. It is the only ongoing assessment of what students in this country know and can do. Well, we were in the field when the pandemic was declared and hit our shores in March of 2020. We had just finished collecting data from the long-term trend assessment for age nine when schools started to close. Well, you know what happened uh, as a result. Uh, Nate, Pims, PISA, Pearls, PIAC, many of the large-scale assessments had to pull out. We could not uh, continue to collect data in 2022 as we had planned. However, with the uh, focus of the National Assessment uh, Governing Board that oversees NAEP, we decided to go back in 22 and to collect data once again from those nine year olds. So what we have two years into the pandemic is a look pre and post, I hesitate to call it post, Bridget, you're right, of what students know and can do in reading and math. And I, I do not hesitate to say, you know, we don't like to always say cause and effect, but I'm pretty sure that what we were looking at was caused by the pandemic. So we went back to 92% of the school, something that NAEP normally doesn't do. We pretty good at randomly selecting schools. Sometimes they are the same, but sometimes they're not. But this time around, we made sure that we went back to most of the schools, 92% of the schools. The results were shocking. The math achievement went down for the first time ever in nearly 50 years. Now, seven points doesn't sound like a lot, but in the NAEP scale, that's a lot statistically significant drop that we've never seen before for these students. Reading scores also decline. The second largest drop that we've seen in 40 years for these nine-year-olds. So the 2022 results clearly show that COVID shocked American education and stunned the academic growth of these students. We have not seen a level of performance that we saw in 2022, March, in decades. So we have a lot to learn. Now, you might ask, well, what else other than these declines? Well, we saw declines across the entire distribution of students from the 90th to the 10th percentile. All of them declined. More, more than that, students at the bottom, the 10th and the 20th, 25th percentile were struggling more, declined more. So the gaps were increasing, and they were increasing because the bottom was dropping faster. Black students, black and brown students declined, white students declined, they all declined, but the black and brown students declined more sharply widening the gaps. You know, before COVID, and you mentioned this in your opening remarks, we were already worried mm -hmm. that the most struggling students were declining, those at the 10th and 25th percentile. Since 2009, we've been tracking this. So what we're seeing now, these, these shocking declines, really are just being exasperated by the, the COVID impact. They were already there. But what we're now also seeing is that the top is also declining. Mm. So this is not the other person's problem, it's everyone's problem. And that's what we need to do. The takeaway for this uh, data that we're looking at, no increases anywhere. Now, we're gonna have more data, yes. it's coming, and so we're gonna have another chance to see where things uh, are going. But I think the bottom line is very, very clear. We have a lot to do. Thank you so much, Peggy. So the point is, this is everybody's problem. Yes. And the, it's historic, the drops that we're seeing. 
Yes. Kent, would you join the conversation? What are some of your early impressions and things that you've been seeing? Um, well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Um, I hope, first, that um, we actually accept the fact that it's everybody's problem. That is one of the problems, uh, I would argue, <laughs> that we've had. Yes. Uh, that as the complexion of who's in school has changed uh, over the last decade and a half or so, mm -hmm. um, I think our political and public interest in engaging uh, has waned a bit. So I hope that we realize, uh, see yeah. everything yeah. there is to see, Peggy, in the data that you've, you've brought to, uh, to bear. Uh, my second observation, um, I, get, I have this unusual job uh, where I get to see the forest for the trees. I, I've got, I get to work, we get to work with schools and districts and states. I got some of my people in the room. And, um, uh, we have unusual access to policy actors. Um, and occasionally I get to interact with the research community, so I, I appreciate that. Um, and, um, and what I'd say is this, I'm actually a glass half full uh, kind of guy. You know, when I think about what uh, educators have been up to, I can only underscore your, your opening remarks, uh, Bridget. Um, they've been through a ringer. Mm -hmm. When you think about uh, being there first, right away, uh, to just care for children and families, mm -hmm. feeding them, you know, yes. whatever they needed, access to health care and the like. Um, you think about how quickly, this is actually good news, um, many places got to sort of one-to-one right. -one on devices, right. um, negotiated deals uh, with right. the companies uh, to kind of get broadband, you know, in place. Right. Just think about right. this. Um, they had to deal with um, uncertain or changing signals mm -hmm. from our public health system, mm -hmm. you know, as the protocols, mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you know, went this way and went that way. And then us adults argued about mask requirements, and things of that <laughs> sort, right? That, that was embarrassing and the kind for of the kids. And, yeah, <laughs> all of that, right? Um, and they just plowed through that, right? And now, of course, they've got a deal, we'll talk about this later today, with staffing shortages. Yeah. And, um, and the politicization uh, of education, right, in, in all the wrong ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yet there's a spirit, I think, um, and a determination uh, to look forward in time, not back in time, right? right? right, right. Um, with regard to the politics of this, there's sort of a good news, bad news story, right? Um, good news is there are these unprecedented resources uh, that have been brought to bear. If not now, when, one might, mm -hmm. one might argue. Bad news, of course, is the clock is ticking uh, on how long these resources uh, will be available. Mm -hmm. um, some of us should argue that the system needs more time. Uh, we should even argue uh, that we need another jolt, another burst yeah. of these kinds of resources if we're really serious mm -hmm. about these mm -hmm. transformative moves that we need to make. Politically, I don't think it's likely, but, um, but where we can bring voice to what's actually needed, I think we should. Um, and with regard to the uh, research community, um, you know, I'm on one of these academy panels. I need a leave of absence from the National <laughs> Academies. You know, could, you, could you elaborate this, a little bit more about the panel that you're on? So um, uh, this is a panel um, uh, studying the 
impact of COVID on children and youth. Um, it's mostly got public health people and pediatricians on it. My wife is a pediatrician, as you know, mm -hmm. and she was disappointed when they appointed me to the panel. <laughs> right? she, she's, she, she's actually worried about maybe the academy standards were starting to, you know, to drop. Um, so I've, you know, I've tried to seek her advice, you know, <laughs> along the way. Um, but um, you know, it's been an interesting effort. Um, you're, you're trying to make sense of something while it's still happening. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Um, and so to some degree, uh, our ability to access data and information about, about it is a moving target. Target, yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, on the other hand, and this goes to, I think, an earlier point you've, you've made, or I know we'll talk about later today, um, it should remind us all the things we already know. Mm -hmm. uh, because as we started to uh, examine um, how uh, we might intervene, I can't tell you what our recommendations are, just like Peggy can't say some things. Um, but, uh, but we do have some hunches uh, about the kinds of things at, at work. And uh, these are things like uh, high dosage tutoring, tutoring yeah. uh, making much more um, strategic, taking advantage of, of time, uh, both um, during the day and the summer, and the summer, and the summer. right? Mm -hmm. uh, things like that we'll talk about. Um, and we'll also get into this question of how we deal with some of the staffing challenges that uh, really interrupt our ability to intervene in, mm -hmm. these, uh, in, in these ways. But um, I think my general point is that the, um, uh, the research community, I think is, uh, this has their full attention, mm -hmm. I'd say that. Um, and um, uh, they're both uh, getting smarter about what the actual impact is or has been. Um, and continues. And continues. Uh, but I think the most important uh, uh, thing here is, you know, I think the energy that's being given to what should we do looking out in, in time. So um, this, it seems to me, is a moment. We haven't had one like this. No. We shouldn't let it go to waste. Right. Right. I mean, this, if there was ever a time to, to sort of think uh, creatively about uh, change and innovation, you know, we're in it. Mm -hmm. The sort of discouraging political context that I uh, referred to, notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I, you know, I just, um, I think that's why conferences like this, you know, are really important, Bridget, to, you know, to do. Um, I know about your students, you know, <laughs> and the kinds of things they're up to. I'm interviewing two of your graduates now for a position. That I vouch for them. Foundation, you vouch for them <laughs> in advance. Um, uh, and so I really hope, uh, you know, that these folks, as they move on from here, and find uh, their next leadership opportunities in education or in philanthropy or in government, uh, really do so, uh, you know, with resolve and passion. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we've both, we've all talked uh, about how historic this is and the fact that this is a moment for all hands on deck. Yes. Um, in fact, I remember when the NAEP results came out, Janice Jackson, the former uh, CEO of, of the uh, Chicago Public Schools, said it's time for a Marshall Plan. It's time to, for a big commitment. Um, I'm curious, Peggy, what has been the broader response to the NAEP results? You know, because we have to get people to understand it's just, it's not some, it's everyone, and that the, the impact has been huge. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say this. Uh, Kent knows that I've been around for a while with these data. And uh, when the NAEP results were released, it was the first time we stayed in the news cycle 
for more than a week with people trying to understand, do you mean to tell me <laughs> that this has happened? Tell me what this means. Mm -hmm. CNN, Fox News, the whole gamut. The only thing that stopped it was the queen. And the queen uh, died, unfortunately. Uh, so there was a shock to the system just in understanding the magnitude mm -hmm. of what we were seeing and what it would mean for a whole generation of students, mm -hmm. I was being asked, what is it that they're not getting? What, is it, what does it mean for moving forward? So people spent, I want to say, a good bit of time just getting their heads wrapped around the depth of the problem, the magnitude of the problem. And we're, Kenneth said it, we're not over. It's not over yet. We have a um, pulse survey. Uh, we are implementing every month, taking a little bit of a, a, a pickable look into schools, K through 12, to see what the impact has, has been and continues to be on schools. And we are astonished every time we change our module, we change modules every month, at what we're picking up that we didn't think about as a problem. And mental health was one of them, one of the big ones that uh, emerged. And not just mental health of the students, but mental health of the teachers. Yeah. Right. I, I was a little right. uh, surprised, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was a little surprised to see it. And, uh, and our schools were not as prepared as they wanted to be. They knew it. Uh, very few of them felt as though they had it under control. Mm. So I think we're still trying to understand exactly how we're going to be in the future, what the new normal will be, and yeah. how is it impacting every facet of this education system and the well-being of the students that we're trying to serve and the people who are trying to serve them. Right, right. But certainly when we were able to reopen schools, you saw so many districts, so many parents, so many people talking about, okay, now we can go back to the way things were. Mm -hmm. And I even started this by saying, you know, we haven't had an in-face, in-person ask with since February 2020. Isn't it nice to be back? But what do you say to people who say, look, we just need to get everyone back in schools and we'll be fine. We just need to go back to what we had in the past. Kent, what, do you, what, what would you say to them? Well, I would, I would say that getting back to in-person is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, I would agree with them about that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would remind them that things weren't so great. Then. <laughs> then. <laughs> Pre-COVID was not the good old days. <laughs> right, so I, I, for, you know, I would want to uh, especially with policy actors, I'd want to um, underscore that, um, you know, things, we weren't all dressed up, you know, uh, you know back, back, back then, and that if we are serious about uh, closing these gaps, if we don't want uh, to give back gains that it has taken us from the data yeah. you have, uh, a couple of decades right. to yeah. secure, then uh, snapping back to the way things were is exactly the wrong thing to right. do. Now, there's a story in all of that for people like me, um, uh, because you know my friends in philanthropy, um, we have been part of the problem. Um, as often as we've been part of the solution. Can I come to Harvard and seek therapy? You know, just, uh, <laughs> just speak the truth. Just speak the truth. Just speak, speak the truth. We'll speak help you out. Truth. All right, thank you. Um, because, um, you know, honestly, I mean, I've, something you said a little bit ago it, it jogged my memory about, about this. Uh, so let me say it this way. You know, there was a period of time in this country when we were closing those gaps. Yeah, right. Right. Your data. I should open my phone. Yeah. Up and get it out. Let's take a moment just yeah. to, to underscore this, because a little known fact uh, 
is we were making progress. We yeah. were. Can you talk a little bit uh, about that? I can tell you exactly when it was happening. <laughs> uh, around 2000, 2003, we started closing gaps in ways that I haven't seen before with these data, and particularly in math. Math was one of those subjects that's very sensitive to instruction. Someone knew what they were doing because they were able to close the gaps, and the bottom was coming up faster. That's how you want to close gaps, right? Because the, 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 those at the bottom got to run faster to help you know, make, make the difference. So everyone was increasing, but the bottom was coming up faster, so the yes. gaps were, small, were, were getting yes. smaller. Yes, yes, around that, 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 that decade, starting around two, 2002, 2003. Well, let me just pile on, because I think the other thing to, to note, um, and this goes to your point in the opening about it's a much bigger deal even than just the school, right? Mm -hmm. When we had a real social safety net, when we were interested in desegregating schools, mm -hmm. when we were interested in building up and professionalizing an education workforce, mm -hmm. Um, when we were interested in equalizing uh, the funding uh, for schools, when all of those things were happening, mm -hmm. we were also closing gaps. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that we're going to accelerate learning without attention to some of these things, I worry. I also worry about. So I, I'd hate us to get into a narrative where all of the burden for pulling this off rests with the schools. Right. Under-resourced uh, to do it. Yeah. Um, and, and the like. That's, that's the, you know, someone ought to yeah. say that. Yes. Someone ought to say it and someone has. You know, um, I serve on the PISA uh, governing board, vice chair for the United States. So, so just to, to define uh, for everyone. Yeah, it is, um, PISA is a, a program for international assessment of st students. It has um, the, um, the most um, developed countries uh, involved in it, OECD countries, mm -hmm. about 38, 36, 38 uh, uh, countries. And um, we formed together this collaborative and we collect data and reading math and science uh, across the world. And the United States is one of the, the vice chair and I am proud to be uh, uh, representing the United States in, in that way. Uh, but one of, the, one of the data collections that uh, OECD, OECD does is around teacher, teacher, teaching and learning. You know, you and I were talking mm -hmm. earlier that um, uh, Secretary um, Arne Duncan, yes. that was one of his pet projects. Uh, back in 2008, the last time we collected these data, that it was very, very clear that we're not doing what we need to be doing to hold up our teachers in this country. The, the highest performing countries in the world look at their teachers very differently than we do. Their professions. They are professions of honor, and they treat them that way. Yeah. Uh, the teachers spend less time, this is perhaps not the time to say this, but they spend less time in the classroom, more time doing research, observing other teachers, planning, those sorts of things, and they pay them well. Uh, and that's what the higher performing right. countries that's what do, they do. That's for what their do. teachers. We're, we got a long way to go to get there. And I, it's not the whole, it's not the solution, it's not the whole, it's not a silver bullet, but we, that needs to be part of the strategy. Right, right. So something Peggy just said, it's not a silver bullet. There are no silver bullets in this, and I think too often in education when we're trying to bring about improvements, people will pick one thing. Yeah. But Ken, even the number of things that you've talked about that we're able to bring about progress, we're raise everyone's achievement, but also close gaps. 
you need a comprehensive mm -hmm. um, approach to trying to improve education. So, you know, as we're getting towards the end of our session, oh, I told you time was oh, going to go fast. So no, good. we still have a few yeah. more minutes. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. There are many challenges ahead, but we always also know that we've done this before. I, that gives me hope. I'm curious, what gives you hope as we look ahead? What keeps you optimistic? Kent, you said you are a glass half full yeah. kind of person. Uh, well, the uh, one source of my optimism uh, is, uh, again, I get to talk to a lot of people that are, you know, in the throes of this. And um, I hear a real um, spirit um, and interest in looking forward, not backward. Just imagine how much harder this would be to pull off if the folks leading the charge uh, just wanted to snap back. Right. to the way things work, right? So um, I, I think this is a time for us to get behind them because uh, they're going to need cover. They're going to need data. Uh, they're going to need uh, a set of ideas about moves that can be made. I, I think one of the more important tactical questions for us right now um, are what kinds of things can we do in the moment with these unprecedented resources that are still available mm -hmm. that actually set a longer term uh, uh, progressive change in motion, right? Yes. That's, I think we need thinking through what those moves look like, mm -hmm. I think is really uh, important for us to do. So we have short term money, but we need to play a long term game. Yes. I should have yeah. just said it that way. <laughs> See, this is why I have this role. That's why you it's got fun. Yes. I, that's what I should have said. That's, that's what I should have said. Just yeah. elevating your words. Thank you. Thank you. I Peggy? It. Well, you know, um, as it turns out, a lot of what needs to be done has been started here with the work of Tom Kane and others, your colleagues here. Yes. I, you know, I, I'm about evidence, providing data, that can uh, that is defensible, that actually charts a path that can be defended through science, and if we can do that, for me, we are, we're going to get that much further down the road. So people can give a lot of lip service to to the different types of strategies, but you know all inequities are not created equal. We need to know what works and what works. Um, best, and then put the resources where they need to go. You know, it's great to have a lot of resources out there, but if the resources aren't being targeted mm -hmm. to the students that need them, to the communities that need them, then it's going to be harder to, to, to make the progress that we need. So I say evidence-based um, strategies that have science behind them is the way we need to go. You know, uh, now my, my people down in Teachers College, if they hear me say this, this will be a problem for me. But, <laughs> We're uh, just broadcasting. You're just broadcasting <laughs> on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. But, oh, that's right. We are broadcasting. Right, yeah, we are. Yes, that's right. That's right. We are. That's, 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 that's right. But, you know, Paul Rebel has got a point of view about how to engage folks around the community. You got people over there know something about how to teach reading. Uh, you got folks Just over there know a little something about, you know, the lives that teachers lead. Um, so, you know, in addition to Tom, I mean, there are a set of intellectual resources here uh, that uh, the better job you do of bringing them into view for the country, the you know, we might get a leg up. But I just want your students to know, you know, you know that uh, they're in the middle yes. of, uh, you know, a lot of intellectual capital that they need to figure out how to leverage. So that was going to be my, my last question. And thank, thank you so much for saying that. Um, we do have a lot of students in the room. We have students who are going to see this a recording of this. What is your advice to them? Because there is so much that needs to be done. There's urgency. The gaps are large. We do need to use evidence-based policies. 
Um, but we also need to learn during this process as we're going along, there will be some experimentation and we need all hands on deck. So for our, the closing question is, what's your advice hmm. to my students about what they can do in this moment right now and in the years ahead? It's gonna take all of us with different perspectives and different skill sets and different disciplines to pull this off. So, so as you asked your question, I was thinking about um, the calm, people who are in communications. What good is it if we had all these great strategies, right? They're working, you got evidence behind them, and nobody knows anything about them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's an example of my perspective, is every discipline counts and has a role in this solution. That's where I would start. Well, according to that clock, we have less than a minute left. <laughs> um, the most important thing I'd say, look, there's a dark narrative about public education. And the most important thing I could say to you is don't be seduced by that dark narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the truth of the matter, and again, this goes back to what we were saying about the system is capable of improving, is that it can. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I think approaching this work, you know, with a sense of possibility. Mm -hmm. You have the very interesting challenge of being constructive critics and uh, forceful agents for change all at the same time. But don't surrender to the idea that the system's broken. Right. It's not. And I think if we can get that straight, then almost anything is possible. possible. Yeah, about that. Absolutely. Anything is possible. And to everyone who can hear my voice, there are so many ways to contribute, whether you are inside of the classroom or outside of the classroom. Whether you are a parent, mm -hmm. a teacher, a counselor, a superintendent, a voter, there are all kinds of ways to contribute. So please join me in thanking Peggy and Kent uh, for being a part of this session today. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're all set.